I am uh, delighted to be here. I'm delighted and honored that Paul would invite me back to Grove City. Um, it's been um, uh, several years, and I'm very happy to be back. And I wanted to thank Brenda Vinton for her uh, very uh, gracious uh, help uh, with all of the logistics of uh, getting me here. Um, but um, one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be back um, is uh, because of the importance of institutions to preserving our civil society and our Republican institutions, Republican with an, a small r. I don't, if you've had a chance to read Yuval Levin's book, A Time to Build, which out, came out a couple of years ago, he talks about the importance of civil institutions uh, operating between the state and the individual and how important they are for preserving uh, civil society and Republican uh, government. And um, I've all long admired the mission of Grove City College and uh, the mission of the Institute for Faith and Freedom. So I'm delighted to be back with you. How many of you have uh, read United States versus Nixon? Not surprising. Uh, United States versus Nixon is about a building in Washington called the Watergate. Uh, what if, back in July of 1974, the Supreme Court had told the nation that um, that burglary at the Watergate was simply a two-bit burglary, that no one from the Nixon administration, no one from the committee to re-elect the president had ever been involved in that two-bit burglary. And what if 50 years later, after all those justices from 74 had gone, and a new, uh, a new uh, group of justices uh, on the Supreme Court had told the nation for the first time the true history of Watergate. You can just imagine the, uh, the, the shock and the consternation and the outrage that would erupt across the nation. Well, Roe versus Wade gave us a false history. For 50 years, it gave us a false history of our cultural and legal and medical heritage going back 400 years to at least 1600 and actually centuries before that. It gave us a, it, it erased that history and it gave us a false history that the Supreme Court in Dobbs finally gave back to the nation a true history an accurate history about Anglo-American medicine and Anglo-American law that for centuries sought to protect the developing human being from the earliest time medical evidence knew that it was alive and to protect it in the law from that earliest time. Dobbs gave us back that history. But I wonder how and when Americans will realize that the court in Dobbs gave, it back, gave us back our cultural heritage and whether anyone will really care. Um, several years ago, I, um, back in 2008, 2009, um, when uh, many doubted that, maybe everybody doubted that Roe versus Wade would ever be overturned, uh, I began to wonder how Roe versus Wade had lasted as long as it had, uh, had, had, had at that time. Um, what, and I came up with a lot of questions that were not answered by the Roe versus Wade decision. Um, uh, the questions like uh, the Doe versus Bolton decision that nobody ever knew about and that has had such an enormous impact on our, uh, on our culture, uh, on our law. Um, it, uh, the cases are Doe, Roe versus Wade and, and Doe versus Bolton, but they both took away, uh, established a national right to abortion for any reason at any time uh, uh, throughout pregnancy. Um, what did the justices know at the time? What evidence did they have? Um, what data did they rely upon and where did they get it? How, how did they come up with the viability rule? Um, what, what data did they rely on to tell the nation that abortion was safer than childbirth? Um, what was happening behind the scenes? So it was those questions that um, created, in my mind, the puzzle of Roe versus Wade. Did they knew they were creating such a sweeping decision? Did they know that it would uh, convulse the nation uh, and national politics and Supreme Court and federal judicial nominations for the next 50 years? 
Did they anticipate any of that? What were they thinking behind the scenes? Because none of that is really on the surface of the Roe versus Wade decision. Even though it's something like 70 pages long, um, all of that is ignored, disregarded, tucked away. I mean, the, 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 court, the court just doesn't address those questions. But I really had a questions about the puzzle of Roe versus Wade. Why, why was it had created such tumult and then did the, did the justices anticipate that? So that's why I uh, wrote uh, abuse of discretion. Or should I say that those questions led me to ask, um, is there, uh, is there a transcript of the oral arguments? Is there uh, an audio of the or, uh, oral arguments? And in fact, if you go to oye.org, um, uh, that has an original audio of the arguments. There were two hours, two hours of argument in December 1971, two more hours of argument when it was re-argued in October 1972, four hours of argument. Um, there's uh, original audio there, original transcripts, and the best way to really understand exactly what was said is to re read the transcript as you're listening to the audio. But oye.org is a valuable resource in, um, in uh, preserving that, that data, that information. But after I found those, I was wondering, what about the personal papers? Are there papers of the justices? Where are they? And I finally found um, eight of the nine, uh, the papers of eight of the nine justices who voted in Roe versus Wade, all but Chief Justice Burgers, which is apparently still under seal and won't be uh, released to the public in, uh, uh, until two, two more years. Um, but that led me to uh, the papers which tell a completely different history than the public's been told before about how Roe versus Wade came about. And um, um, that's why I think Abuse of Discretion is the most important book about Roe written since Roe because it examines those personal papers which tell a completely different history about Roe versus Wade. Now, the, 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 the standard story about Roe versus Wade is that the court just applied uh, a, a series of uh, precedents about privacy going back to the 1910 or the 1920s, and they uh, enveloped uh, uh, abortion into that series of precedents. Um, the court really only approved abortion in the early months or the first three months of pregnancy. The court really adopted a compromise, middle of the road position on abortion in Roe versus Wade. The heroine was Sarah Weddington, who took the case up to the Supreme Court and you know won a uh, a wonderful victory. Um, and they also uh, the court uh, or the standard story is that that the law going back hundreds of years never treated the fetus as a human being until birth after delivery not at any time of of pregnancy um, that the uh, abortion laws were unenforced and unenforceable in the 1960s at the time uh, and, and when the decision was decided um, and um, and, and those, those questions, uh, or those, th that's the standard story. But abuse of discretion gives us uh, the real story, uh, focusing on the two years of deliberations leading up to the release of the decision in January 1973. Now, Paul has given me the title of how we got Roe, but I think I need to tell you, uh, and I will this morning, um, just how bad it was and how important Dobbs was for overturning that decision and returning the issue of abortion to the 50, 50 states. Now, politics did shape the Roe decision, and we see that in abuse of discretion. We see that in the papers of the justices. And there were many political over uh, uh, factors and, 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 and influences, but I think these are stand out. The sexual revolution of the 1960s had a huge influence on the justices, on their families, on their thinking, um, and uh, the sexual revolution of, of the 1960s uh, gave way to um, talk about the population crisis. I mean, today many countries are facing population implosion, not population explosion. 
I mean, uh, we're, we're fighting even to re remain in the United States a, a, a replacement uh, rate of, 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 of pregnancy or, or children. Um, but the pop population crisis was a, was a huge national political issue in the 1960s. I mean, just six months after um, President Nixon was inaugurated in January of 1969, he gave a national address, I guess on primetime TV, to the nation about the population crisis. And he named a um, national commission on the population crisis, which released its report in March of 1972, just while Justice Blackman is writing his drafts of the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, Robert McNamara, who had been um, Secretary of Defense during the Kennedy administration, and I think went on to the uh, World Bank, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Robert McNamara gave a, um, a speech, I guess, to, to the UN, um, which um, basically compared the population crisis, and he used the metaphor of the mus a mushrooming cloud of a nuclear holocaust. He compared the population crisis to a, a nuclear uh, uh, explosion. Um, then there is the fact that, as some of you may remember, uh, uh, Richard Nixon ran against the Warren Court during the 1968 presidential campaign, and how the uh, Warren Court was kind of out of control and uh, just overturning precedents uh, left and right. And um, uh, you might think that uh, not until 2016 um, when uh, Mitch McConnell held open the Supreme Court seat after Scalia's death, had the Supreme Court been ever been as much at the center of a Supreme uh, of a national presidential election as it was back in 1968. So Nixon campaigns against the Warren Court, and um, then when he starts to add justices to the court, he immediately replaces Earl Warren with Warren Burger. Um, and then before Roe versus Wade, he names three more. Um, that created kind of a bottle of scorpions within the court. And um, they, some of them were out to get one another, um, or out to get other ones. Um, in my opinion, Harry Blackman never should have been named a Supreme Court Justice, simply because he was not prepared, he was not he did not have the temperament, he did not have the judicial character, he did not have the decisiveness to make judgments on that high level in our federal judicial system. He was a respected federal judge, but the only reason, really, the only reason he got on the Supreme Court is because his boyhood friend was Warren Burger, and when President Nixon's first two nominations to the Supreme Court uh, were rejected by the Senate, Warren Burger influenced President Nixon to name his boyhood friend Harry Blackman. But being a boyhood friend doesn't qualify you for the Supreme Court necessarily. Um, and then um, the court starts to hear the abortion issue, takes the um, uh, cases Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton in April 1971. But in September 1971, a crisis erupts in the court when first Justice Black uh, resigns um, and dies a week later, and there's a national funeral honoring him. And Justice John Marshall Harlan uh, retires one week after Black uh, due to his poor health and dies at the end of 1972. Those two vacancies uh, of justices or the retirements of Black and Harlan, uh, who probably would have voted against a, a national right to abortion, and the vacancies they created created a crisis within the court. It reduced the number of justices from nine to seven. It created, uh, it flipped the balance of the court, and it created a 4 3 temporary majority, uh, which was very pro abortion and wanted to sweep away the abortion laws. So all of those political factors heavily influenced um, the deliberations and the outcome in Roe versus Wade. So um, this is the court that took or agreed to hear Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton in May of 1971. So in the, um, in the uh, uh, sitting down in the first row, 
From left to right, you have Justice John Marshall Harlan, Justice Black, Chief Justice Berger, Justice Douglas, Justice Brennan, and in the back from left to right, you've got Justice Marshall, Justice Stewart, Justice White, and Justice Blackman. Uh, that's in uh, the court that took these two cases uh, in May of 71. That's the court that heard Roe and Doe for the first time in December 1971. Harlan and, and Black are gone, um, and you've got um, five justices who had been on the Warren Court. Um, and just two uh, appointed at that time by President Nixon, and you've got a 4-3 th majority that wants to overturn the abortion laws. And then this is the court that decided Roe versus Wade in January 1973, because there were 15 weeks of vacancies, uh, or 15 to 17 weeks of vacancies from September 71 to January 72, when President Nixon's two nominees in the back row on the left side, uh, Justice Powell on the far right side, Justice Rehnquist, are the two new justices that Nixon names to the Supreme Court. But by the time they joined the court in January 17, uh, 72, the four three uh, who had been on the court um, had already voted in the abortion cases. And they had set the momentum in place and Justice Powell and Rehnquist uh, even if they w had wanted to, could not have reversed the momentum. Uh, coincidentally, Powell ends up voting uh, for Roe versus Wade. Rehnquist uh, with White are the two dissenters in Roe versus Wade. So here are the major findings uh, in my book. And uh, again, I would encourage you to read Abuse of Discretion uh, because you'll have a much better understanding of how bad Roe was and how necessary Dobbs was. Um, but um, you can't tell from reading Roe and Doe that there was no trial, no trial record, no evidence in the cases that went up to the Supreme Court. Um, the, the case out of Texas, Roe versus Wade, the case out of Georgia, Doe versus Bolton, had, had no trial, no evidence, no witnesses. And so everything you read in the Roe v. Wade opinion is conjured up by Justice Blackman doing his own research or taking data, medicine, law, history from interest group briefs that were filed in the Supreme Court for the first time. None of that is taken from the lower courts. Uh, he made it up um, because he, he had to, and I'll, I'll kind of explain that. Um, they originally took the cases to decide a federal state jurisdictional issue. So when Harlan and Black were on the court in 71, they originally took these two cases not to decide the abortion issue. They took the cases to decide a uh, in, in the weeds legal question that um, you know, would be considered quite boring to most people. But it was a question of whether a state court criminal defendant can take their case into federal court. Now, if the court was, took the case to decide that issue, then it wouldn't need an evidentiary issue about abortion. Abortion was kind of a sidelight. This is a legal jurisdictional question, very much a legal question, not a factual question. And so it's not surprising uh, that the court took these two cases despite the fact that there was no trial, no evidence about abortion. Only after the vacancies, only after the 4-3 majority decide to use these two cases to decide the abortion issue and create a right to abortion is the lack of evidence and trial and a record critically important. Um, so the, this temporary majority of four, which was Douglas, Brennan, Stewart, and Marshall, um, they were pretty, pretty set on sweeping away the abortion laws before the first oral argument in December of 1971. Um, they had addressed the contraception issue in Griswold versus Connecticut, and this 4-3 majority also took another contraception case called Eisenstadt versus Baird during the time of the vacancy um, in uh, October, November of 71. And 
the same 4-3 majority decided to strike down any limits on the sale or distribution of contraceptives to single individuals. Now you remember Griswold versus Connecticut in 75 was um, about marital privacy and about uh, a, cr a, cr a ban on uh, a criminal ban on uh, the marital use of contraception. So Eisenstadt versus Baird was 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 uh, taking the contraceptive prohibition on on any regulations much further, applying it uh, that to individuals and basically creating a right uh, to contraception without restrictions on sale, distribution, even to minors, um, a, a great step further. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the private papers of the justices or the personal papers of the justices show that there was this dynamic in which Blackman was assigned the writing of the Roe versus Wade decision after just being on the court for about 16 or 18 months. And um, he was continually pressured by the four in the majority to um, expand the decision, expand the decision, expand the decision until it goes from a very narrow kind of first draft to a sweeping um, declaration of a, a national right to abortion without, for any reason, at any time uh, of pregnancy. Now, um, Sarah Weddington is reputed to be the, uh, the heroine of Roe versus Wade because, of course, uh, uh, she was pro-abortion and she fought for abortion rights. But the best advocate in Roe versus Wade was really the Georgia Assistant Attorney General Dorothy Beasley. Um, and I have um, a clip of her argument uh, in, I believe it's the first round of arguments. She argued in favor of the Georgia abortion law. She argued for personhood. She knew what the problems were with the record in the, in the case. And she was an experienced Supreme Court advocate very sharp, very quick on her feet, um, uh, never made a mistake in these arguments, uh, never really questioned by the justices that I can tell uh, about any problems with her argument. Um, but she raised the red flags about no evidence and no record that unfortunately the court ignored and she wasn't vindicated until the Dobbs decision. But um, this is the text and she starts out with this facial attack. She means that the plaintiffs in Roe and, uh, or in, in the Doe versus Bolton Georgia case had, had challenged the Georgia law as utterly unconstitutional despite the fact that there had been um, you know, decades of enforcement of an earlier law in Georgia going back to, the, to 1876 when the original law was enacted apparently in Georgia. Um, uh, or at least one abortion law. And uh, this is her argument. Uh, worked yesterday. <laughs> do we have the, it, do you know if the volume's up all the way? Thanks, Tim. There we go. constitutionality of the statute, and all these statistics and uh, what the doctors think on one side or on the other, and whether the abortions are saving the childbirth and so on, are really not before the court because they were not introduced into evidence in the court below, so they are not part of the record. Now, certainly the appellants tried to uh, present evidence, and 
It was the only hearing that was held before the lower court, which hearing lasted about two hours at the most. Uh, there was only argument, but both sides uh, came prepared to present evidence. And of course, in order to attack the constitutionality as to its effect or its operation in Georgia or its applicability, I submit that we would need a fuller record and that if there is an attack on the face of the statute, uh, it cannot be supported uh, without looking at these further facts uh, unless we can say that the state has no interest whatsoever in protecting fetal life. And I think that the interest which the fetus has as a human fetus in this instance becomes broader as time goes on. I think the state has a greater obligation to protect that fetal life uh, today than it did in 1876. And for this reason, it's more protectable now than it ever was before. There are more methods now that can be used to protect it, including uh, blood transfusion and surgery while it's still in the womb. Now, this, I think that's one of the troubles with this case. Uh, it's so um, that's her uh, argument from the original arguments. That's the original audio from, from 1971. She saw the problems. She raised the red flag. She warned the court. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there wasn't a majority to listen to her. Um, um, another major factor was simply the willfulness of the temporary 4-3 majority at that time. Um, uh, there's a uh, the, the court the first oral argument was December 13th 1971 and shortly thereafter Justice Brennan writes a memo to Justice Douglas at the end of December um, say uh, referring to a number of threshold issues which should simply be finessed um, none in my opinion forecloses decision on the crucial questions here uh, the existence and nature of a right to an abortion. So questions of evidence, questions of record, questions of procedure, questions of jurisdiction, those are the uh, issues that he thinks can be finessed so that they can proclaim a right to abortion. Um, as I mentioned, Blackman was pressured by Douglas and to a lesser extent perhaps Justice Brennan um, and others. Um, Harvard professor Noah Feldman in his book called uh, Douglas the most unabashedly liberal results-driven justice ever to sit on the Supreme Court. And that uh, it explains really uh, how results-oriented the court was about abortion and how much a results-oriented decision Roe versus Wade was. So in the future, honest uh, law professors should uh, teach Roe versus Wade um, as, as a classic example of the dangers of results oriented judging because they made up their mind to sweep away the abortion laws and then had a, th uh, then, uh, ha had a grapple with how do we write it? How do we explain it? Um, how do we rationalize it? And um, the, the, those problems created defects in the Roe versus Wade decision that lasted till Dobbs. And if you read the Dobbs decision, you'll see Justice Alito hints at some of those problems and criticizes Roe for some of those reasons. Um, so the, the original defects in Roe in 70, January 73 stayed with the decision for 50 years, caused problems, and created the reasons for the court to reconsider uh, Roe in Dobbs. Um, one uh, of the, the major factors is the medical assumption that drove the, the court and the outcome in Roe versus Wade. This was an assumption that abortion is safer than childbirth. Where did they get this? There was no record, no trial, no evidence. Where did they get this? Well, they got it from interest group re, uh, brief filed by Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And where did they get the data? Well, the data was from Soviet bloc countries from the 1950s. 
And in some cases, this data was simply raw numbers raw numbers of women injured or raw numbers of women who died after abortion. That's what they based this mantra that abortion is safer than childbirth upon. And um, that, that shaped the, the entire structure of the Roe versus Wade decision. It influenced the majority in Roe to declare a right to abortion. Heck, it's safe. Uh, to defer to abortionists for self-regulation, to expand the right from the first trimester to all the way to viability, which is 16 whole weeks. First drafts in the Roe case were limited to a right to abortion in the first 12 weeks. Only after the second round of arguments uh, was the right uh, expanded to viability. This notion that abortion is safer than childbirth drove it all. Um, Dorothy Beasley denied this fact at, at oral argument. She said, that's not before you, whether abortion's safer than childbirth. There's no record here. There's no evidence. It's not before you. We need a fuller record. Ignored. Um, so um, it shapes the entire framework of Roe versus Wade. The viability rule became a huge part of the Roe decision. In fact, in 92, the court said it, that the central uh, or the essence of, of Roe versus Wade or the right to abortion was a right to abortion up to viability. So the viability rule was at the heart of Roe versus Wade and at the heart of this national right to abortion that the court was creating. And um, in two rounds of arguments, Two hours of argument, December 71, two hours of argument in October of 72. The V word was not mentioned once. Viability was never brought up to the court. No party, no friend of the court urged that line on the justices. And not until after the second round of arguments did the justices start jockeying behind the scenes as to the expansiveness of this right and they latched upon viability and just put it in the next draft. That's how it came about. So because of these problems, there were all kinds of un unintended consequences. The court didn't realize that it was bec going to become the National Abortion Control Board because the court, in uh, page 164, 165 of the Roe decision, drafts a national statute in great detail. So. When the states go back and try to pass parental notice and consent, informed consent, clinic regulations, any, re any limit on abortion you could imagine, it's got to go back through the courts and get federal court approval, um, many cases going up to the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court, through the court and its uh, a management of the, and authority over the lower federal courts, became the National Abortion Control Board without the expertise or know-how or ability or the resources to serve that role. Um, and and, and um, as a result, which I don't think they uh, really understood, uh, national abortion politics was centralized in the court, um, you know, affecting every Supreme Court nomination and many lower court, federal court nominations um, for 50 years. There was a public health vacuum because in Roe and Doe together, the court swept away every abortion law in all 50 states. So there's this vacuum. And as the states try to pass even public health regulations on abortion, they were stymied in the courts and that public health vacuum uh, existed until Dobbs and we might say still exists. Um, the court didn't have Solid, any solid data about the risks of abortion. And over the years, um, international data has become better than domestic data uh, from Scandinavian countries, for example, about the increased risk of preterm birth after abortion, the increased risk of breast cancer after abortion, the increased risk of mental trauma after abortion. Um, the court had none of that in um, 71, 2, and 3. Um, the court issued this broad right to abortion despite the fact that many states had prenatal injury laws, wrongful death laws, fetal homicide laws that protected the unborn child from um, the earliest time of prenatal development. So on one hand, 
um, the states have all this law, which, have de which has developed over the last 50 years and grown in protection for the prenatal human, and yet the court's declaring an unlimited right to abortion. Um, and um, although the media talks about the public being polarized as if 50% of the public is radically pro-abortion and 50% of the public is uh, radically pro-life, um, that's not what the public opinion polls show. It shows basically a 60 to 70% of Americans in the middle and 15% on one side or another. Um, so the public isn't polarized even now. So Roe gave us a, a false history, um, but which I will quickly go through um, because I want to open it up for questions and answers. But um, the court told us that abortion was never a crime, at least it wasn't a crime before quickening, um, which was the notion of um, fetal movement being the best indication centuries ago um, that there was a, a viable pregnancy and a living unborn child. The court said the fetus had no rights until birth, which is why they could create a right to abortion up to birth, because the fetus had never had rights up until delivery. Um, and the court told us that abortion laws were never really adopted to protect the unborn child. They were just adopted to protect women's health from dangerous surgery. Dobbs, I would encourage you to read. Um, it is a, a, a statement of national importance. Uh, it thoroughly addresses the history uh, in Roe because um, uh, the history is so much a part of the Roe opinion. Uh, the court in Dobbs uh, thoroughly examined our American legal heritage, um, pointed out that there were rules of law that were adopted uh, centuries ago to protect developing human life. The colonies adopted that law, and the states in the 19th century, based on new medical data, new medical science that um, pregnancy began before quickening or that the unborn child was alive before quickening, alive from the time of conception, based on that medical testimony and data and understanding of medical science, the states um, started to abolish their quickening rules and pass broader protection for prenatal life and that consensus really held until 1967. Now you might ask about precedent. What about precedent? Roe versus Wade was 50 years old, or 49 and a half. Plessy versus Ferguson was 58 years old before it was overturned in Brown versus Board of Education. And separate but equal of Plessy versus Ferguson was overturned uh, by the court basically applying the Equal Protection Clause in Brown versus Board of Education. You may have heard the term stare decisis, which is the Latin maxim that is the part of the doctrine of or serves as the uh, underlying um, doctrine of precedent. Um, but if you just hear stare decisis, and if you went to law school, you heard this in law school, that just means stand by des the decisions, or stand by decisions. That means stand by any decision, any time, just because it was decided. Well, the real Latin maxim is stare decisis equiete non mover. That means um, stand by the decisions and don't disturb what's settled, or don't disturb what's quiet. So settled law is the essence of the doctrine. It's not about just, deci uh, just standing by any decision because it was decided by five justices. It's about settled law and the importance of settled law to the integrity of, of the judiciary. Um, that means that if a, a decision is settled law, like Brown versus Board of Education or Marbury versus Madison, a judge has to have a compelling reason to reconsider it. But if a, a decision is unsettled, then it's defective. And stare decisis says the judges should reconsider it to fix its defects. And Roe versus Wade, at the time of Dobbs, was radically unsettled. And stare decisis, in fact, compelled the court to re-examine Roe versus Wade and to fix it. So, um, um, so the um, so the current doctrine of precedent that the court has applied for the last couple of decades comes down to these six set factors. This is what the doctrine is today: is a decision settled? Was it rightly decided? 
is the rule that adopted workable? Has a change in facts eroded the original decision? Has a change in the law eroded the decision? And are there uh, substantial reliance interests in the original decision? Well, um, the majority opinion by Justice Alito and Dobbs doesn't go through each of these in detail, but you see these factors discussed. And these factors, um, in the majority's opinion in Dobbs, weighed in favor of overturning Roe versus Wade. Um, so this is where we are with the Supreme Court right now. This is the next Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, or um, it really shows you that um, the time we're in is that um, instead of responding to Supreme Court decisions with um, legal reasoning and debate and analysis, um, it is basically about shaming the court, intimidating the court politically. So you stand in front of the court and you harangue the court about any decision you don't like. And, um, and that's a, a serious problem. And um, you know, we need to have a, uh, a right understanding of the authority of the court, but keep the court honest by, of course, evaluating uh, its decisions, um, especially when it's about constitutional interpretation and how well the decisions are anchored in the Constitution. And again, I think in Dobbs, the court uh, very carefully goes through um, text, history, tradition um, to show that there is no national right to abortion and that Roe versus Wade had to be overturned. So I would turn stare decisis back on Roe versus uh, Dobbs. <clears throat> is Dobbs settled? And what will make it settled? Um, those are really important questions. I think elections and public support for the decision over time are, uh, will settle the Dobbs decision. Thank you very much. Questions? We will now begin Q&A, so just raise your hands and Anna will come to you with the microphone. Thank you for your talk. I can't even believe we're here needing to have this talk when something is so obvious that it just seems not arguable. But thank you anyways. I did have a question on um, the slide titled um, Unintended Consequence. If I understood you correctly, at one point you said the, the federal court overruled the state laws um, on abortion. Why is that not the case now? Why isn't the federal the last word? Well, because what the court did in Dobbs, they, by, by declaring, by Roe declaring abortion a federal constitutional right, it gave the federal courts the authority to manage the right and protect the right to abortion. In Dobbs, the court did the, did the opposite. The court in Dobbs didn't aggrandize power. It didn't centralize power. It decentralized authority. It decentralized power by saying that whether or not there might be a right uh, to abortion in a state statute or a state constitution, there was no federal constitutional right. And therefore, the federal courts are out of the picture. And the court, I mean, you might, you might have wondered before Dobbs, what does it mean to overturn Roe versus Wade? Well, the court explained that um, in, in, in six different ways in the Dobbs decision very clearly. And it, it, it unequivocally sent the, washed his hands of the abortion issue and sent it back to the states. So, pardon me? It sounds a little like pilot. Well, it, it, it disclaimed federal constitutional authority. It disclaimed its author, uh, power to control the issue and sent it back to the states, which, which, and the states had controlled the issue frankly, since the 1600s when they were colonies. So it had always been a state issue, always. Um, and, and frankly, um, 
there is there is really little evidence that the 14th Amendment was intended to change that. The 14th Amendment was about slavery and it was about the rights of the freedmen. And the word abortion, unborn child, pregnancy is never ever mentioned during the de uh, debates over the 14th Amendment. Uh, and, and, the, and the Dobbs court, uh, and in the Dobbs opinion, majority opinion, implicitly recognizes that, that until 1973, abortion had always been a state issue and Roe never justified taking it away from the states. And we saw the states, we saw f federal and state courts after June 24th last year basically obey the Dobbs decision, which helped serve, serves to settle the Dobbs decision. Federal courts washed their hands of the abortion issue. They refused to strike down state laws. They allowed state abortion laws that were on the books to go back into effect. Um, and so it is, uh, the abortion issue is returned to the 50 states. So now that it is at the state level, um, how is it that a governor can make that kind of a decision per state in comparison to um, things being decided at the state level and they're have it, it having to go through sort of the judicial process? Is it, is it because through all these years it's already done that each state? Or are states are due, are, or is it just that governors really do have that kind of authority of power, or are they acting outside of their authority when they do that? Or if you could that, explain a little yes. more how that works or should be working, I, I, that would be great. Um, that itself is a state-by-state state question. Um, some states, many states, repealed their pre-Roe abortion laws um, and may have had to enact new laws. Um, so um, um, in some states there, at the time, uh, on June 24th last year, uh, there was no prohibition of abortion on the books, or there was no prohibition before 20 weeks or before viability. Um, in other states, there were heart, heartbeat laws prohibiting abortion after six weeks. In other states like uh, Alabama, there were laws prohibiting abortion from conception. Again, we all have to be uh, we all have to be attentive citizens, we all have to be attentive voters and know what the law is in our state. Um, so the power of the legislature in some states um, uh, you know, may be dominant in affecting abortion law. Governors are supposed to enforce, so what's the law in the books? Um, but one of the concerns I had on June 24th last year is how many governors or attorney generals are going to stand up and enforce the law that's on their books uh, if they had abortion law on their books. And um, you know, since June, uh, immediately or thereafter, and then in the succeeding months, um, 14, 15, 16, 17 governors and attor or attorney generals stood up and said, this is the law on our books and we're going to be enforcing this you know, tomorrow or you know, when the law allows it to go back into effect. So it's all a state-by-state -state issue involving who's, the, who's in the legislature, who's the governor, um, who's on the Supreme Court. Because um, uh, there, has, uh, there was a, uh, a uh, it was the Iowa Supreme Court just a, a month or two before Dobbs that overturned an earlier decision and said there was no state constitutional right to abortion. There have been um, courts since state courts since then saying that there is a state constitutional right to abortion. So it's all up to the states now. Who's on the state courts are more important than ever. Who's governor? Who's in the state legislature? What the majority is more important than ever. So I'm not sure I completely understand the legal workings, uh, but is there a path for uh, this issue to come back to the Supreme Court on the federal level or, or on the state level if somebody brings a, a case, it's just not in the federal jurisdiction at all, anything? So I guess my short question is, is there a path where abortion could come back to the federal level and make its way up through the Supreme Court? There are going to be 
abortion issues which are going to make their way up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and, um, and without getting into the legal weeds too much, uh, on one hand, the court in Dobbs said in, I, I think, 18 different ways, literally 18 different statements, that we're, we are releasing our control over this issue, we're sending it back to the states, and we're not going to touch the basic constitutionality of abortion whether it's a 14th Amendment personhood issue or whether there's a right to abortion, we're not going to touch it. But there is a, two cases right now making their way up to the Supreme Court involving the FDA's authority to approve what used to be called RU-486, uh, which I refer to as chemical abortion or mifepristone. Those cases are now uh, moving their way to the Supreme Court. They could be I mean, they could be on preliminary procedural issues like injunctions. They could be up in the Supreme Court tomorrow. Um, the, the Fifth Circuit um, apparently, um, well, there, there are two different cases. There's a case challenging the FDA's and, and wanting to sweep away any regulations on chemical abortion. And there's a case in Texas um, in which the judge decided that when the FDA approved our, uh, mifepristone chemical abortion in 2000, it ignored the law, violated the law, law, and had no authority to approve it for the American medical market. Those two cases, opposite cases, are moving their way through the courts. And um, it uh, remains to be seen whether the court will actually hear those cases or defer to the lower courts. It remains to be seen. But so um, some statutory issues may arise, some federal issues may arise. But Dobbs makes clear to me that this court will not reconsider whether there's 14th Amendment personhood or whether there's a right to abortion, generally constitutional right, um, any time uh, in my lifetime. We've often talked about how these decisions throw the legislating back to the states. In your opinion, what would preclude the United States Congress from passing its own federal abortion restrictions, and how would that play out in the courts? Uh, that question is, is going on. It's going to uh, arise, I think, sooner or later. Um, there are some who believe that um, Congress has the authority under the Commerce Clause because abortion, mifepristone, chemical abortion, and, and the instruments of abortion move in interstate commerce. Abortionists move from state to state. Um, 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 clients move from state to state. They may go over a state line. You know, we now have a abortion tourism, as one of our speakers is going to talk about. So, um, uh, you know, uh, the states surrounding Illinois, for example, uh, have strong limits on abortion. Illinois is an abortion haven. There are uh, women from Iowa and Indiana going into Illinois. So abortion moves across state lines. Does, does the Commerce power allow Congress to create a, a national right to abortion? Or does the Commerce power allow Congress to enact a national prohibition on a court of any kind on abortion? Does it, Justice, Justice Thomas, um, back in 2008, um, kind of raised the question um, offhand in, in an opinion uh, as, as to whether Congress had the power to pass the National Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act under the Commerce power. And before, because nobody raised it, he didn't address it. So that Commerce power question, or whether any other part of the Constitution gives Congress power to, um, to uh, allow abortion or <coughs> limit abortion, is going to be, I think, faced by the courts sooner or later. There is, for example, the mail power. The mail power was used by Congress before Roe versus Wade to prohibit um, uh, the use of the mails to um, disseminate uh, uh, abortion drugs. There are two federal statutes right now, 18 U.S.C., I think it's 1461 14, and 1462, long-standing, going back decades, that are on the books right now won't be enforced by this Attorney General that, that specifically prohibit the use of the mails for abortion or abortion advertising or disseminated abortion. That, those questions could arise in the court if you got an Attorney General to enforce those. 
Uh, other questions involving federal law could arise. I oh, hope that answers your question. Without Roe, would we today have in vitro fertilization involving the creation and destruction of uh, human embryos? That's a great question. Um, I think we would, yes, simply because of the technology. I mean, um, law, law follows technology. You know, the entrepreneurs move ahead with technology, and then legislators kind of wake up and say, hmm, we should look into that. Um, uh, you know, IVF um, produced the first uh, baby born in Britain in 1978 or 79. The first American baby born from IVF was in 1981. And although Roe kind of suggested that there could be no laws protecting human embryos, um, that was wrong, but it, it, pre it, it influenced the culture, I think, to encourage IVF, but even if there had, I mean, it's, it's plausible to think that it would have moved ahead, but if, if the court in Roe had, had reached an opposite decision and, for example, said that the unborn child was a person under the 14th Amendment, it might have squelched IVF and IVF would have flourished in other countries. Um, I, but I, I, tend to, I, tend to think, um, I tend to think we'd still have it. Dr. Forsyth, I'm always concerned about story, and I think that I heard Dr. Kingor say that President Reagan had you on a list to pull you up to the Supreme Court. Is that correct, or did I mishear that? Wow. <laughs> did I mishear that? I think I, that's the first time I've heard that one. <laughs> oh, do you know that story? <laughs> what? Ah, yes, yes. Bill Clark. Yes. Gosh, I just, I thought there was a revelation that I'd missed. <laughs> so it wasn't uh, you. That was, that was William P. Clark. William P. Clark was, um, uh, uh, was a, was a uh, California Supreme Court justice um, uh, after being an advisor to Governor Reagan. And then uh, Bill Clark, William P. Clark, went to Washington, D.C. with the Reagan administration he was in the uh, he was in the State Department before becoming National Security Advisor, and then I think ended his career as in Interior Secretary before retiring from the Reagan administration. Great man. Okay. One more question. Yeah. One more. One more question. Oh. Um, one of your slides talked about schizophrenia, but you didn't go over that. I just wondered what that point was. Uh, well, uh, I didn't use the word, but I, I did address what I've called legal schizophrenia, and that is that in the decades before Roe versus Wade, the states through prenatal injury law had uh, recognized the unborn child as a human being um, that could be injured in the womb from, say, a doctor or from, you know, anyone assaulting a pregnant woman and injuring the child or killing the child. Um, so the, many states a, a, allowed a, pre, a, a cause of action, a civil action, for prenatal injury if, if it could be proved, the, you know, the cause of the injury and so forth. Some states also uh, allowed wrongful death cause of action. If the prenatal injury ended in a death, a wrongful death action could be brought for the killing of the child. And wrongful death um, is for the killing of a person. So some states have allowed that uh, the, uh, the unborn child is a person within their wrongful death law, some from conception. And then finally, there were some states that had, um, had, had recognized the unborn child uh, within their fetal homicide laws or their homicide laws and therefore treated it as a crime to kill the unborn child. When uh, I tell it, I tell it, there's a chapter in the book where I tell a story, to make a long story short, about a clerk who brought all this law to Justice Brennan and said, if you declare a right to abortion, what are you going to do about all this existing law in the states? And according to the clerk who I interviewed, Justice Brennan said, We'll take that up in the next case, but they never did. <laughs>
And so that schizophrenia between state law and the declaration of a national right to abortion has stayed with us for 50 years. <laughs>